This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Melinda Kiefer and welcome to Live Green Tennessee, where we take you across our great state to explore agriculture, agritourism, sustainable living practices, and so much more. In this episode, we visit with Mark Murphy, owner of Bottle Hollow Farm located in Shelbyville, Tennessee, to learn about sustainability practices at his certified organic farm. Then we visit David Harmon, owner and founder of Native Maps, who graduated from the University of Tennessee with an MFA in painting. David says if you really want to become familiar with a city, get off the beaten path. That's the process this East Tennessean uses to create his handmade, screen printed neighborhood maps made with renewable energy coming from the hydroelectric mill at the French Paper Company. And finally, we sit down with Dr. Tom Samples at the 11th Annual Fall Gardeners at the Plateau Research and Education Center in Crossville, Tennessee. Tom is a professor at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, serving as an extension specialist for turf grass management and discusses sustainable practices. All this in the next episode of Live Green Tennessee. Located in Shelbyville, Tennessee, known as the walking horse capital of the world, Mark Murphy, owner of Certified Organic Bottle Hollow Farm, sits down with us to share tips on his no-heat jalapeno peppers, which have an excellent flavor and crunch without the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Mark believes in taking great care of his soil, known as the foundation and guiding principle behind everything he does. Uh, my name is Mark Murphy, and uh, along with my wife and daughter, we have Bottle Hollow Farm here in uh, Shelbyville. We're about seven miles uh, southeast of Shelbyville. Um, our farm would most accurately be described as a market garden. Uh, we grow on a small scale in an artisan garden style and sell directly to consumers at local area farmers markets. I had always been an organic gardener just for my personal interest and uh, so when we started the farm here about three or four years ago um, I decided to go ahead and pursue organic certification uh, so we went through that process and got the farm certified organic um, mostly it was more of a paperwork and you know ordeal than anything again because I was already using organic practices to start with so it was more just going through the process and getting all the records and, and keeping up with that stuff for the organic certification. And uh, I just felt it was important, you know, you can always tell customers, well, we use organic practices and this and that, uh, but some people just feel more comfortable if you have that actual certification to, uh, you know, back that up and that way they know that you're really following those practices and getting inspected and that sort of thing. So each year um, you have to recertify uh, your organic certification and uh, they'll send inspectors out uh, to look over both your record keeping and look over your grow areas each year so that you know they can determine that you're you know following the rules doing the things you're supposed to be doing uh, you know make sure that there's not any issues with your with your certification in organics and organic certification, probably the first thing that most people think of is no chemicals. Uh, you know, we don't use uh, chemical fertilizers. Uh, we don't use man-made chemical or synthetic pesticides and herbicides. Uh, that's probably the first thing people think of. And there's actually a big push um, in the organic process uh, a big focus on soil. They look a lot at what you do uh, to maintain your soil, your soil organic matters, which is important for carbon sequestration, uh, and just overall important for the health of your soil. Uh, so they want to see that you're doing things like organic mulches, that you're doing cover crops, um, all those kind of practices that help maintain the fertility and the overall health of your soil system. Soil tests are important um, 
more as a baseline of where you're at fertility wise uh, you know you can find out where your potassium and phosphorus levels are and a lot of your micronutrients uh, you can also get tested for your soil organic matter content to see if you're you know doing a good job at maintaining your organic matter levels and of course a lot of that you can tell just by sight so to speak because you can recognize uh, you know any grower or farmer that, that's gained or just home gardener even that's gained a little bit of, of personal experience you start to recognize what a healthy soil looks like and feels like and how it acts so there's a lot of those things that you pick up by intuition and then the test you know kind of help you confirm a lot of those things we're kind of proud that we operate our garden in a very sustainable manner uh, we collect our own mulch materials right here on site. We use a lot of grass clippings, leaves, things like that that are available to us to mulch the garden. And we really prefer organic mulches as opposed to, uh, you know, nowadays you'll find a lot of situations on farms where they're using landscape fabrics and plastic culture systems, where they're using synthetic materials as a, as a mulch layer to keep down weeds. And uh, we prefer to use organic materials, which is more labor intensive because obviously you have to collect and distribute all those materials. But in the end, I think it's just healthier for the soil system. Those organic mulches help contribute to your overall soil organic matter as those materials break down. And again, they help with weed control, moisture retention. You just get all kinds of benefits out of organic mulches like that. So we collect all those materials ourselves right here on the farm. We don't have to import those materials. And uh, we also collect our own materials and make our own compost for the farm. In Tennessee, uh, especially the middle Tennessee area here, you can essentially have three growing seasons. You have a cool season in the early spring. You have sort of your peak summer season. And then you can also have another cool season in the fall. Um, we concentrate mainly on the early spring season and summer season and then typically by the fall season our markets are winding down and we're transitioning more over into doing cover crops uh, to kind of restore the soil or, or cover it for winter and get ready for the next season. We start um, in January uh, actually sowing the seeds for our transplants. We do our own tomato and pepper transplants. Uh, and we also sell uh, transplants, tomatoes, and peppers when the farmer's market's open in May. So we grow uh, transplants both for our own use here on the farm and for our market customers. And then uh, also in the early spring, we'll be planting things like peas, carrots, uh, those kind of cool season crops. And uh, that'll transition over into summer when we actually start putting tomatoes and peppers in the ground and sowing beans and uh, cucumbers and those type of uh, summer crops. And uh, then we just, uh, we stagger a lot of our crops throughout the summer, uh, you know, beans, things like that. We'll keep planting in succession so we have a continued harvest through the season. Uh, we'll stagger like tomato plantings uh, up through June uh, so that we always have like some fresh tomato plants coming on because uh, it's been my experience and most of the growers that I talk to um, if you're going to grow tomatoes in Tennessee you're usually going to deal with blights and uh, the leaf blight situations a lot of times your earliest tomato plants that you plant you know midsummer going into late summer they'll you know start to get spent so if you've got some later planted uh, tomatoes coming on a lot of times you can keep your production going uh, after some of those early plantings are winding down weather is is the consummate challenge uh, for any farm um, it, you know sometimes you get really lucky and you have kind of that perfect balance of, of you know just enough rain and just enough dry uh, oftentimes though you have you know either way too much rain at one time and everything's getting drowned or you have way too much dry at one time and everything's you know getting parched um, so that that seems to be the consummate challenge for any farm whether you're organic or chemical uh, one benefit uh, possible benefit to or the organic system 
is you do tend to build more soil organic matter, which gives you a little bit of drought insurance because the more uh, good or ma organic matter content that you have in your soil, the more moisture the soil can hold and retain. So it gives you a little bit of, of hedge there that, that poorer soils wouldn't have. We do uh, a variety of crops. We do some fruits, uh, strawberries, blackberries. Uh, throughout the season, depending on the time of year, we'll do peas, carrots, uh, beans, cucumbers. We do a lot of tomatoes and peppers. One thing that, uh, that we really enjoy here at the farm is, is growing a wide variety of peppers. And uh, something that I've learned uh, at the markets is the majority of people are not aware of the vast variety of sweet peppers uh, that are available. Um, a lot of people, most people are familiar with bell peppers, uh, but there's a whole array of uh, sweet peppers out there that just really open up a whole new, you know, flavor, whole new options in your cooking and your recipes. Something that happens often at the market with us is people come by and, and we'll hear them say, oh, you know, those peppers look great. I, I just can't do hot peppers. And, you know, we always try to catch them and, and communicate with them, talk to them a little bit. But if it's a real busy market, sometimes before they, you know, if they don't stop and read our signs or, or talk to us a little bit, sometimes they get gone uh, before they realize that most of the peppers that we have on our display are actually sweet peppers that are not hot at all. So that's something we spend a lot of time trying to communicate with people and uh, let them know about a lot of the sweet pepper varieties uh, that we have and that are out there available, uh, you know, both for them to purchase from us at market or, you know, gardeners can get the seeds for themselves and, uh, you know, expand their own garden selection and grow them for themselves. Sometimes a map gets you from point A to point B, and sometimes maps help to bring back memories. The man behind Knoxville, Tennessee's native maps says each of his hand-printed designs started with known neighborhoods. I tend to take the long way whenever I go anywhere and I just love exploring different parts of the city and turning down roads that have never been down before and making Knoxville feel like home for me. When you sort of, you've lived there for a while and then you dig in and you realize, wow, there's so much more beneath the surface. It can be as simple as just going out of your way on the way home to drive down a street you've never been down before or supporting a business that you've never uh, walked into before. A little bit of new perspective can go a really long way. I started Native Maps in 2011 and it was really out of a love for my hometown, Dallas. I grew up in Dallas and I guess you could say I grew up kind of driving across the city sort of back and forth. A friend and I sat down one afternoon and started to map out the city almost just for fun. So that was really interesting just to dig into those kind of nooks and crannies and parts of the city that I had never explored. So we started with our Dallas neighborhood map and I started selling that at local markets in Dallas and connected with a couple of stores and started selling in those stores. And then we moved to Knoxville, Tennessee for grad school um, at the University of Tennessee. And about halfway through grad school, we decided to expand the concept and try to take on a handful of other cities and see if we could treat those cities like our hometown um, with the same amount of care and connecting with locals in each of those cities to make sure that we got all of the information right. So we started Native Maps halfway through grad school in Knoxville out of the attic of our home. I love screen printing as well because it's a very hands-on process. Each map passes through our hands several times before, uh, before we roll it up into a tube and ship it out to a customer. It's something where we're actually putting the ink on the screen and, and pushing the ink through the screen onto the paper. So it's something that is very much a handmade process. And I think there's something about that that comes through in the finished product. Really, when you think of a specific neighborhood, you're not thinking about 
the streets, you're thinking about the people in those neighborhoods or the connections you've made or the memories you've had there. And I think to me that's the beauty of, of really any map is it sort of lets you hold all of those memories and all of those experiences in, in one kind of visual product. Making the Knoxville map was sort of taking that one step further and just really digging in. Exploring the whole city, really making sure I knew it well and kind of had a good, um, good sense of, of what I was representing. That was definitely a big part of, of feeling at home in Knoxville, was making the Knoxville map. I think with, with any city, and especially with Knoxville, some neighborhoods are really well-defined and some neighborhoods aren't, and you really have to kind of dig in and actually drive there yourself and understand where the boundaries are. And even sometimes I've stopped into local establishments and just asked, like, hey, what do you call this neighborhood? Or how do you, how do you sort of relate to this area and sort of the areas around it? Um, so that was definitely a part of the making the Knoxville map too. I really enjoy taking the neighborhoods that aren't as well known or maybe uh, the people in those neighborhoods are really proud to live there but they might not be as as well known or historically relevant. So I love digging into those neighborhoods as well and just making sure that the whole map is each part is equally accurate and well represented. We really wanted to make a map that locals were proud to hang in their home. We love hearing from locals. That's really my favorite part of making these neighborhood maps is talking to actual locals in each neighborhood. And if somebody speaks up and says, hey, where's my neighborhood? Well, I'll include it almost immediately. So whenever we start a map, we come up with the rough draft ourselves. So that's, that's mostly me looking at all of the resources online and I'll take all of the different maps that I find and layer them in, in Illustrator on the computer. And if there's a consensus in, in any given neighborhood, I'll go with that. If there's not a consensus, then I'll do a little more digging. People can get really up in arms about their neighborhood and just get very opinionated and interested in what should be included and what shouldn't be included. And I really love when that happens just because even if they're a little feisty about it, it means that they love their city and that's, that's why they care so much. In Tennessee, we have Nashville, Knoxville, and Memphis, and then we also have a map of Franklin, Tennessee. And as far as other major cities that we have are Manhattan, Brooklyn, Los Angeles, Seattle, Dallas, um, and probably about 15 other major U.S. cities. I think it's always important to respect the history of a city and to be really inclusive um, and knowledgeable about each city that you're making to try to build our, our business and our process so that that map can always change and adapt and grow. It's worth getting to know all of those different sides of, of a city. What I enjoy most is meeting actual people in, in the city and in those neighborhoods and just hearing from them why they love their city. Located at the Plateau Research and Education Center in Crossville, Tennessee, we sit down with Professor Samples from the University of Tennessee at the 11th Annual Fall Gardeners Festival, whose primary interest is the management of turf grass using research-based sustainable methods. Dr. Samples works in the Department of Plant Sciences and discusses how grass, soils, water, and pests all contribute to healthy environments. My title is the uh, University of Tennessee Extension uh, Turfgrass Science and Management Specialist. What I love about my job is I have statewide responsibilities and I still have the budget to be able to travel across the state. So I get to uh, troubleshoot problems in turf. I work uh, a lot with high school football fields, high school baseball fields, some with uh, professional sports. Um, do quite a bit of work with um, trying to maintain safe athletic fields, parks and recreation, golf course. Even though the term specialist is used, what I love about my job is it's, uh, it's dealing with turf grasses, but in very many, in a, in a number of functions. Sustainability to some means no chemistry. 
or to others might mean all organic. But in the way I frame the word sustainability is that we're using uh, materials in an appropriate manner um, and that we're creating or improving the turf situation, we're improving someone's quality of life, we're improving, improving the performance of a turf, um, we're mowing at a proper height of cut, we may be actually uh, introducing sand in an effort to create a, a little bit of a different soil texture so the soils are more able to resist compaction. Believe it or not, turf grasses are kind of interesting plants in that they, uh, you know, when you think about photosynthesis, they, they have the capacity to uh, capture sunlight and turn that energy in, from sunlight into chemical energy that the plant can use. But in that process, the turf grasses give off oxygen. Thank goodness for us, you know, the, uh, as humans. Thank goodness that, the, you know, uh, the, plant, the plants are capable of doing that. But in the case of a turf grass, in many cases, they become stressed within the root system because of a lack of oxygen. So it's almost counterproductive. You know, here's a plant that is capable of producing oxygen to the benefit of humankind, but one of the most restrictive factors as it relates to healthy turf may, may just simply be that uh, you need to aerify the soil to improve the oxygen level and release carbon dioxide from the soil. When you think about uh, aerifying, I think in terms of selective cultivation. If you're gardening, and you use a rototiller, you're cultivating and you're relieving compaction. But you can imagine how destructive uh, using a rototiller in your home lawn would be. But there's a process that we refer to as core aerifying that basically allows for the removal of cores. A certain percentage of the cores, maybe less than say 10% of the total surface area is impacted. But what it does is it extracts cores of soil and turf grass plants and deposits them on the surface of the turf and then that actually improves the ability of oxygen to move into the root zone. Uh, it improves the rate at which water moves into the soil and through the thatch and it also improves the uh, release of carbon dioxide so that the turf grass environment root wise is much healthier. Real mower that was invented involves curvilinear blades and then a, a cutting blade we call a bed knife and the curvilinear blade kind of reaches out and pulls the turf grass leaves to the bed knife where it, where it is cut. But when you think about mowing, uh, one thing I always like when you talk about sustainability, it's interesting to me that turf grasses like to maintain a certain amount of aerial shoot mass and root mass. So if we elevate the height of cut, we tend to see an increase in rooting depth. So if you want to limit the amount of maintenance that you do in, let's say, in your home landscape, you would, you would, uh, within any turf grass species that you're managing, there's an optimum cutting height range. So uh, you can elevate the height of cut. Generally, as a result of that, you have greater insulation. You, you might be able to see a drop in the uh, soil surface temperature as a result of having more insulation because you have a higher height of cut. And you've also might notice a deeper root system because of the fact that as you elevate height of cut, you generally see that root response that's very favorable. Uh, we, let's, let's use zoysia grass as an example. That's a warm season turf. It prefers uh, growing at temperatures of 80 to 95 degrees. On a golf course fairway, it may be being cut at 5 eighths of an inch height of cut. Those fairways are generally irrigated. They're generally uh, receiving herbicidal treatments and so on. There's a lot of maintenance that goes on just simply because you're providing a, a surface that will support the game of golf. You can take the same variety and species and manage that in your home lawn at two and a half inches. And it requires much less management. So, um, so sustainability is, is kind of, in my view, it's uh, trying to determine the best way to get the most from your turf grass with the least input without, without compromising the environment. When you think about water, it's so critically important. Most sod producers, when, when you look at sod producers in Tennessee, they'll site their sod production sites near water. Richland Creek uh, sod farm, or um, you may actually have wells that are pumping into a lake that is used to supply water from which the turf is irrigated. Sod producers generally want to be able to apply about a half an inch of water per acre per week, per growing week. And so that will 
almost guarantee that they will have actively growing turf grasses such that they can harvest the crop in a timely manner and then reestablish the next crop. And so water, you know, when you think about a turf grass plant, it's basically over 70% water. But the key is organic, you know, you can have a, a high quality turf that's managed organically, or you can have a high quality turf that's managed using synthetic products, or you can have a hybrid program that involves uh, both. It just depends on your philosophy. But the organic programs, what we generally do, we focus on soil health. You want to maximize the soil environment so that the turf grasses can perform to their potential above ground. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Live Green Tennessee, where we take you across our state into the farms and businesses of those who are making the moves to eating fresh, living sustainably, and helping us all be more organic in our thinking and the way we live our lives as Tennesseans. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Live Green Tennessee. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.